And now I'm laughing. Shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, think of dead puppies. Think of dead puppies. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Swear Method. Before we get started, um, we do have a new Patreon subscriber and supporter. Uh, So thanks very much to Ellie for jumping on and supporting us on Patreon. Hooray! We love you, Ellie. We love all our Patreon people. And sorry it took us so unforgivably long to actually get around to this shout out because in truth, we haven't actually recorded together in weeks and weeks and weeks over the Christmas and New Year's holiday and most of the nightmare on earth for me that was January. So here we are. <laughs> and thanks very much, Ellie, and all of our Patreon supporters. You're all very awesome. And the rest of yes. you are very awesome, too. Very, very awesome, indeed. Uh, would you like to go first? Yes, please. Okay, go for it. Okay. The word I have been thinking about, considering breaking down and generally getting jiggy with this week, <laughs> is method. Ooh. M-E-T-H-O-D. I like and I, I have to point out that since deciding that this was the word I was going to talk about, I have had TV on the radio method stuck in my head pretty much consistently. Now, it's a great song from a great band, but frankly, I'm hoping that once this episode is recorded, that particular earworm scurries away or worms yeah. don't really scurry, do they? Slithers away at speed. Yeah. OK. Because it's beginning to be a little bit tiresome. If you don't know way. the song or the band, please check them out. It's one of my faves. However, method, it's a little word, but it has a lot to say. And I you like know how those. we like those. Yeah. So loosely speaking, the etymology of the word comes from Latin, uh, borrowed from Greek, and can be broken up into two main parts. The first part, the meth part, is from the same root as the word or the, the prefix meta. Oh, okay. As in metaphysics, as in meta, well, meta all kinds of things. And the etymology of this prefix on the OED is is substantial. Here's what they have to say about it initially. Ancient Greek meta, or if it comes before a vowel, it's just met, or in the case of method, meth, used as combining form of the preposition meta, meaning with, after, between, and it says it's probably, probably ultimately, the same Indo-European base as mid, as in in the middle of something. Oh, okay. Compare Mycenaean Greek, me, ta, meaning together with, which is perhaps the original sense in Greek. In ancient Greek and Hellenistic Greek, meta is combined chiefly with verbs and verbal derivatives, principally to express notions of sharing, action in common, pursuit, quest, and above all, change of place, order, condition, or nature in the last sense frequently corresponding to classical Latin words in trans. So trans prefix, a change of place, order, condition or nature. Right. Occasionally meta represents the preposition meta in syntactic combination with the sense of after or behind, as in metaphrenum. I don't know what metaphrenum means. It's such a wonderful word. I really should have looked it up. Yeah, I don't know what that is. There are, um, there are a ton and a half of of meta words, as I'm sure you can imagine. And what I was particularly interested to find is that, you know, these days the word meta is used by itself as a a standalone adjective or um, perhaps even a standalone noun. And what I liked so much about that is it's so recent. So we have in that sense of, of meta as an adjective or an adverb or as a noun, the earliest citation of the definition given here, designating or characterised by a consciously sophisticated, self-referential and often self-parodying style, whereby something, as a situation or person, etc., reflects or represents the very characteristics it alludes to or depicts. This is first cited in New Republic in 1988. 
And that's that's not long ago at all. Wow, no. the sentence is so meta. That that sense. And interestingly, yeah. that article from 1998, the full citation states, he predicts that, like retro, meta could become independent from other words, as in, wow, the sentence is so meta. If so, you heard it from me first. Wow. Now, what's interesting about that is, that's a rather meta citation. Yeah. <laughs> it's saying, we might use this word like this. And if we do start to use it like this, I'll have been the first person to tell you about it, which is, of course, the whole principle behind the OED's method of citation. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. We then have the the noun chiefly and originally uh, American English, something that is self-parodying and self-referential in reflecting or representing the character characteristics it alludes to or depicts. And again, very recent, the earliest citation for this sense is from the Boston Globe in 1993. Wow. I can talk about a trendy example of meta, the player, a movie about movies, a movie about movie making. And that I think is, is the sense that, that we tend to consider the word, the, the prefix used by itself. This idea of, of self-reference, of parody, of kind of wholeness of form and intention. I think I would, I would put those two together. In terms of the word method, we have this word, th this prefix combined with, with all its many combined meanings, combined with the word originally Greek, odos, or occasionally hodos, meaning way. Oh. So, the etymology of the word method quite simply means in pursuit or in quest of, meta, a way. Trying oh, to find the way. And that's very cool. That, you know, that, that brings us to it's it's a word that's it, it's applied to more more things than I was expecting to be honest when I looked it up. The very first definition given in the OED is that a method is a procedure for attaining an object. Now that's quite a broad definition. The obsolete sense that's given first than the earliest sense from around about 1425 is of a recommended or prescribed medical treatment for a specific disease. It can also be used in a figurative context, as in the, the way to fix a thing, the way to treat a thing. These days, I suppose you'd talk about a pathway or a protocol within medical sort of circles. But right. this um, 1425 citation is from a book called Grand Chirurgy, which is mm. uh, just incredibly good fun to say. But it's specifically about the the drugs and methods and and ways of treating disease. And then the second one from around about 1541 is a translation of Galen, the often considered the father of modern medicine. We've got two Methodists, not just in the sense of John Wesley, Charles Wesley and their religious movement, right. but Methodist, Methodism, excuse me, was a, f a physician of a school of thought in ancient Greece, Greece and Rome, <laughs> holding views intermediate between those of the dogmatic and the empirical schools. Listen to this, you'll like it. Okay. According to Celsus, the ancient Methodists, called in Latin methodici, in Greek methodikoi, differed from the dogmatic school in basing their treatment not on principles deduced from a classification of diseases according to their origin, but on the theory that morbid conditions consisted either in looseness tightness or a mixture between the two, defined as fluens strictum or mixum, each of the three states having its appropriate set of remedies. So the Methodists were interested in what was tight and what was not, <laughs> as of really course a way to, uh, to, to treat disease. Kind of, I mean, vaguely similar to the sense of humour, certainly in the sense of balance. Yeah. That's an idea in medicine that's, you know, if you look at Chinese traditional medicine, for example. Those guys have had all of that stuff sewn up for a very, very long time. Right. So the Methodists were not just praying for our souls. They were also considering ways to tighten them up. <laughs> we then get to more generally a way of doing anything, especially according to a defined or regular plan, a mode of procedure in any activity or business. And that sense comes from, first of all, 1526, 
the king had hopes to train the emperor to reason by dulce methods. So this sense that if you wanted to learn something, if you wanted to do something, if you wanted to fix something, there needs to be a, a way, a way to get to that. Yeah. So it's not really a word that's changed a great deal in terms of its sense. It was picked up very quickly by, by science, both in terms of the prefix meta, uh, used all over the place in chemistry, and then, of course, in the sense of reasoning as, as in metaphysics, but also scientific method. Definitely, yeah. a, a, you know, a clear way, a clear path, but containing some of this sense of a journey or a road. You know, it's yeah. not just a... It's not just a thing that you do. It's a thing that you do to get yourself somewhere. Yeah. So, and th it. there's an activity. To, there's an activity built into it, like the seeking of the way, or you know, like pursuance mm, yeah. of the way. It seems like quite an active way to to pursue something. It's a pursuit. It's not just a a performance. Yeah. And then, of course, with performance, we have the sense of um, Stanislavski and the method. So, as in method right, actors. Yeah. Those those people are definitely seeking something, um, usually <laughs> usually in ways that are pretty hair raising and crazy to yeah. people who who don't subscribe to that particular way of working. But you have you know Marlon Brando, a famous method actor, up to the present day, De Niro, um, Daniel Day Christian Lewis, Bale. people like that. So yeah, yeah, that's interesting. This is a, it's another example of. How our our brains, you and I, just work differently, and how, as the listeners may have noted over the course of the episodes, that when Amy goes high, I tend to go low, just sort of by instinct. And so, <laughs> while while Amy was very lucidly and interestingly expounding on the early Methodists as scientists and austere medical professionals who are interested in the soul and the body and the tightness or looseness and tightening up our souls. All, literally all that just immediately sprung to mind was like sort of a 1980s, early 90s aerobics style movie, like home video <laughs> with a bunch of 18th, 16th, 17th, 18th century scientists in like vaporwave aesthetic purple and pink leotards trying to get our souls to tighten up. <laughs> using the Soul Blaster 3000 or something. And Soul I'm, Blaster 3000. I'm sure I have one of those in my garage. And it's it's because I'm not a grown-up is why <laughs> this is happening. <laughs> but here we are. I, I love when Ryan tells me he's not a grown-up. You know, I, I also consider myself not particularly grown-up. And um, I, I don't think there are all that many people who would argue with me on that point. <laughs> Ryan is, however, a father of three and he's about to become a lawyer. I don't really see that there's much in the world more grown up than those things. <laughs> so if if you are a you know you are indeed a man of many parts, but it seems to me that some of those parts must fight quite often. Oh, all the time, <laughs> all the time. It is a war zone in here. Um, <laughs> very cool method. That's method. neat. I like that. I like it when, as is almost always the case, when there's a word. The, the reason I like how we do this is that you come up with a word and say the word and I immediately go, awesome, I have no idea what you're about to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's very neat. Very cool. Um, my word this week is another, actually another listener suggestion. Ooh, nice. Um, and this comes to us by email from Kathleen on behalf of her 11-year-old grandson. And I didn't get a name for her grandson and so this one goes out to... Him specifically, and also everyone who has or has ever had a grandmother. I think that covers most of our bases. Um, and Kathleen's grandson was specifically wondering, he kind of had an idea. He was familiar with the concept of, uh, sorry, I haven't even said the word yet. The word is swear. Okay. And so he was, he was familiar with the verb to swear, as in mm -hmm. uh, to swear an oath or to, to make a promise but not quite clear on how it came to be or if there was a connection or what the connection was between that and bad, quote unquote, bad language, bad words. Which is important to learn about when you're an 11 year old boy. It's, this is vital. It's vital like information. It's peak swear time. Absolutely. Sorry, Kathleen. I, I wish that wasn't the case, but you know, if... right now your grandson really, really loves the bad words. Oh, all the bad words. Um, 
So, the, swear is a very, very old word. It is first cited in the OED as early as the mid to late 600s. Mm. So it's extremely old. One of the oldest I've actually seen cited in the OED. I've never seen a, or I don't see many in the seventh century, but here we are. Um, and it is one of the most resilient words as well, because it is always, literally always since the 600s. So we're coming up on a good 1400 years of this word, meaning to affirm, assert, or declare something by an oath. And even in those very, very early days, it had several uses that were all related to that. So you could swear on something or you could swear mm -hmm. by something. But even in its very earliest uses, it's also, like the OED says, quote, affirm, emph or, sorry, affirm emphatically or confidently, brackets, without an oath. So I'm not sure what, uh, yeah, you could swear an oath or you could just swear by something or on something or you could just swear something. But it, it has always meant this sense of this sense of uh, to promise or to affirm something. And so it wasn't until much later on that the branch of meaning bad language came along. So it's about the 15th century. So we're now in the middle oh. of the 1400s. And 900 clean years. 900 years before it started being used by 11 year olds. And <laughs> uh, the bad language offshoot came around then. It, originally in the sense of, as with a lot of cases, I don't think this is particularly surprising. Like when I read it, I kind of went, yeah, that makes sense. It's sort of, it started out as a, just a weakening of the what used to be the power and reverence of swearing an oath. Okay. So as people started to, uh, the way the OED uh, cites it is, uh, to utter a form of oath lightly or, irre or irreverently. Uh, and so just, it went from there to further using kind of divine names or objects in an otherwise frivolous or outright profane manner. Uh, and then from there, more widely to use just anything that was considered bad language, which itself is an incredibly amorphous term. And what was once bad language is no longer bad language. And what used to be fine is now bad language. And some things that have always been terrible have always been terrible. And yeah, it just sure. depends. It's, it's very, very hard to pin down what bad language means. It's all contextual. <laughs> but it started with, that's where the transition came, is people would take it very, very seriously, almost, well, not almost always, usually and very often in a very religious, solemn, ceremonial purpose. Mm -hmm. And then to sort of profane that by using it to like, I, I, I cleaned my room, I swear. Originally, that was bad profane. language. Another word which has its roots in... Uh... Which has its roots in, in the church and in religion. Yeah, exactly. But like swear has come to mean anything that we consider to be bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. So etymologically, it came from English way back in the beginning from the Germanic side of the family, which makes sense because it's the 600s. So it definitely predates French influence and most sort of Latin influences. So it's the Germanic side from Proto-Germanic, I don't know, Sweryanan? S-W-E-R-J-A-N-A-N, -A -N, which is the source I'm, I'm of... I'm loving, I'm loving your, uh, your very scholarly attempt at, at pronunciation, <laughs> similar to my own. I don't know. Let's uh -oh. give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just dive in. Yeah. I, I, any Proto-Germanic speakers, please do get in touch. Um, yeah, we would love to know how we're supposed to say these words. <laughs> uh, and then Swearyanan or Swearyana. I, I feel like the J's probably got a little bit of a glide in there, Swearyan. Anyway, uh, oh, that's enjoy the yourself. source. Yeah, that's the source of a bunch of other related words uh, that all mean the same thing in Old Saxon, Old Frisian, Old Norse, Danish, Middle Dutch, and a bunch of other languages that I can't pronounce either. And so... <laughs> But they, but it's it's interesting that it's been so resilient in all of those ways. And I feel like that might be part of its ceremonial or might be due to its ceremonial use. Like things that are mm. very codified tend to be fairly resilient because they're protected, right? Like Yeah, sure. Um, Adam Online posits that it might have come from a pie root, swear, S-W-E-R, which simply means to speak, talk, or say. Mm. And... Is another shout out to Casper, which no, it notes is the sort of svara, S-V-A-R-A, which means to quarrel, 
in da da da, da Old Church hey, Slavonic. Hey, Old Church Slavonic. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, it's hilarious that that's a thing we keep coming back to. It's so weird. <laughs> um, so the other I thing, really, really want some sort of product that says I heart Old Church Slavonic on it. That might be part of I feel of, like we both need one of those. I'm thinking I'm thinking 2020 is the year we have Lexitecture merch and one of our mugs should probably be I heart OCS, but we'll yeah, see. For sure. Um, a, an interesting little tidbit from this is that the word swear is related to answer, which, of course, ah. people often be like, why does answer have a W in it? That's dumb. And it probably is dumb, given that we don't actually pronounce the W. But it's not out of nowhere that that W is there, because that the swear, the swer, answer, in answer, is literally, because the word answer is literally made up from the roots, meaning against and swear. And so it's an, another one of these, I can't believe I've never noticed that before. It's so obvious when someone points it out. Right. Yeah. That's what I said, too. I read that. I was like, of course it is. Of course yeah. it is. Why? Yes. Obviously. <laughs> Psha. Um, <laughs> so it's literally made up of swear. Uh, so it means to swear against. And it basically is uh, to, it's a sworn statement rebutting a charge or an accusation. Like it was a very technical mm. and specific legal rhetorical term. And you still see that in... He swears, I answer. Yeah, exactly. And like there are legal proceedings where the official term is and this person's answer or often reply. But it, that's where it comes from is to swear against or to nice. a, yeah, a sworn statement rebutting something. The other thing I couldn't help but look into is uh, my favorite source of televised profanity, Al Swearingen. From Deadwood, I was I was wondering about Al Swearingen when you you spoke about the old Germanic word because it strikes me that uh, Al Swearingen might have had something of the old Germanic about him. I might just yeah. be confusing that with American gods and Odin. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. The point is, Ian McShane is a national and international treasure, and we should all love him. Um, if you don't love Ian McShane, I urge you to do some soul Change. searching. Yeah, change. Um, <laughs> just change. <laughs> just change. Uh, so, Al, then, and I always thought that Al Swearingen was kind of the the producers of Deadwood being just a little too clever by half because he's this like ridiculously eloquent and simultaneously eloquent and foul mouthed, prodigiously foul mouthed guy named Swear Engine. And I was like, that just works wasn't the too Swear perfectly. Engine a, a real person? But Al Swearingen was indeed a real person that I, yeah. I learned when I looked this up. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not them being clever. That's someone else being clever. And in, and in fact, I don't even think it's connected to the word swearing at all. It is Germanic. <laughs> it, the best I could find was the uh, Oxford University Press's Dictionary of American Family Names, mm. which seems reputable. It's Ooh. not just Doug's name generator online There's on GeoCities like or whatever. Spend some time with. And it said... Uh, it. It's a, a locational surname and almost certainly comes from one of two places in Germany called, and again, I don't know, Schweringen? Schweringen? Well, I'm thinking that... Um, S-C-H-W-E-R-I-N-G-E-N is are the names of Schweringen. these two places. And so I don't know, I wasn't able to find out why those places were named that because they're very small places and they don't have extensive... English uh, Wikipedia or other informational mm -hmm. entries that I could find. So if there is anyone out there who is uh, Germanic, uh, perhaps perhaps I'll just bug our old friend Susie Dent who loves German and I'll just drop her a line on Twitter and find out. But I don't know if there's a connection there between swear and the schwer in these place names. But uh, that's really, the best really I could do for Al Swear. somewhere engine. to be called Swear Town. Yes. Right? You know, surely somewhere in this whole wide universe, there's a swear town somewhere in some language. There's got to be. In some history. There has to be. With all the, like, I mean, even just between Newfoundland and Britain, the yeah, idea exactly. that there's, you know, like, yeah. I mean, there's a place, <laughs> there's a road in the UK somewhere called Fanny Hands Lane, which is yeah. just... That's already the best. So there must be a town called Swearville or Swell, yeah. Swearborough or something. There is, a, there is a place in Zurich, just at the, the 
far end of Lake Zurich called Rappersville. Oh, that's neat. That always uh, amused me greatly. I have a story about Rappersville that's probably not relevant to this podcast. It involves me being on a bike for much, much longer than I intended to be on a bike. (laughs) And Rappersville was our intended destination. We did get there, but I was unhappy by the time we arrived. But yes, if Rappersville exists, then surely swear town's got to. Yeah, somewhere out there there's a swear town. Somebody get in touch with us. If you speak German, tell us where Schweringen came from and how I'm supposed to pronounce that thing. And also if there's a, anyone who knows there's a swear town. But yeah, yeah. that's uh, swearing for cool. Kathleen's 11-year-old grandson and 11-year-old grandchildren or former everywhere. 11-year-old grandchildren everywhere. <laughs> uh, there is an outstanding episode of History of English that's about swearing. Oh, I, I love it so much. It, it was just outstanding, but but one of the things I really loved about it was it it talked about. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before. Or we've certainly talked about it before. Uh, Kevin takes us through the the kind of transition between swear words being about the church, almost always, you know, l- literal profanity, and how they kind of began to be about things like bodily fluids and and sex and and more kind of bodily process things yeah things that that are still kind of considered to be taboo you know don't show them off down the high street but that you know, some sometimes bizarrely because you know we we all have this stuff in common yeah but uh one of the the, the coolest things about it was that it's there are scholars who believe that this basically happened because of the chimney what have we have we talked about this i i, I feel like no. I've, I've mentioned it before but Essentially, prior to the chimney, rooms had to be big because if you wanted to put a fire in the room, it had to be big enough that no one would suffocate from the smoke. Right. So if you had a large, you know, your your sort of Beowulf style hall. Yeah. With a single fire and a large space with lots of people in it. None of those bodily function things were actually private. They happened with all the other people in that room just kind of kicking about in the room at the same time right. as you were having sex and pooing and peeing and, and you know, all these other things that, that have begun to be, well, began to be kind of mildly and in some cases incredibly offensive. Yeah. But the, the chimney, the chimney allowed houses to be split up into smaller rooms and that then allowed rooms to have specific purposes and rooms like the bathroom and the bedroom began to be private. Huh. And once those things began to be private, the things that happened in those rooms began to be profane. And just less talked about. That's really interesting. Yeah, very cool. I am, in fact, I'm, I'm sitting right now looking at... Dear listeners, I discovered yesterday that Ryan had never heard of the two Ronnies. Or Morgan yeah. Wise. Now, this is a great surprise to me on two counts. Firstly, because they were both so ubiquitous during my kind of growing up, learning what funny was years, that it is inconceivable to me to imagine that someone would not know these these people, these comedians, because they were so, you know, that they were huge in terms of, you know, realising that comedy was just comedy for no other reason and that there were people whose job it was to do that. But also... Because Ryan loves British comedy. And I, do. I was I was really quite surprised that he'd never gotten as far back as, as the kind of <clears throat> I suppose, you know, seventies comedy. It, it's very, very different. And a lot of the kind of things like the young ones and Alexi Sale and, and people like that were, were kind of seen as a reaction to the kind of nineteen seventies, slightly benign, suitable for all the family kind of comedy stuff that was going on. And arguably the two Ronnies and Morkman Wise belong to that family. But they're also incredibly funny. But at the same time, I've completely forgotten why I started talking about this. I was talking about chimneys, and then I was talking about you're here. You know, look, you're sitting here looking at. Oh yes, you might not know about this either. Okay. Uh, Rogers Profanosaurus. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. What? Now, Rogers Profanosaurus <laughs> is a publication adjunct to a British establishment uh, central magazine which is called viz okay you've never heard of viz either <gasps> ryan your life has just gotten about 300 percent funnier 
<laughs> I love so, when that happens. British listeners, if you don't know the Viz, get a copy. It's in almost every news agent's. It's it, it basically it sets the boundaries of what irreverence and rudeness are, particularly the sort of irreverence and rudeness you can put into a a print publication. So in every episode of the Viz, there is a a section of Rogers Profanosaurus, and do you know I'm just I'm just going to read you a couple of entries. Just give me okay. a minute, and I'll 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 find the Profanosaurus and let you see exactly what this is all about. That's very neat. Speaking of British things, I a note uh, my, the when I did the episode on cartoon and carton last time, I was struggling. I I thought I remembered uh, the name of the show with Nish Kumar wrongly as the Mash Report, but it is in fact the Mash Report, and it is in fact a fantastic show hosted by a fantastic person, which just goes to show that it, Amy's not making it up that I am mildly to moderately obsessed with British comedy and have been for quite some time, but... Yeah, well, this is it. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, I couldn't quite believe that... I couldn't quite believe that you had the such... <laughs> you had such an obsession, but had never got into this bit. Excuse me. I'm, I'm already laughing because um, I, I've opened the book at random and... Yeah, it's very funny. Okay. <laughs> please, please don't let your 11-year-old grandson be listening to this, yeah, Kathleen. Yeah, 11-year-olds, it's time for not Something podcasting else. anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, we have drop the kids off at the pool. Right. Euphemism. To defecate in the toilet. We have things like that. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> place to learn swear words that are not necessarily quote-unquote swear words, but that which are quite... Terribly offensive, nonetheless. Yeah. And if there's one thing, I know I, I butter up the Scots a lot, just in general, but man, the Scottish people's ability to turn virtually anything into just the most cutting insult and swear word you've ever heard is <laughs> just inspiring. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's Oh man, like Scottish Twitter is the place to be. Scottish Twitter is, I, I, I feel proud to be where I'm from when I see Scottish Twitter. As it's, you it's should. fantastic. And A, it helps with Scottish accents because you can't read it other than in a Scottish accent. Like, <laughs> and it's, oh man, it's so there's good. A, there's a great episode of, I think it's Mock the Week, where the Scottish comedian Fred Macaulay is on. It's, it's quite, an, quite an old episode. But he talks about the Scottish ability to swear in almost any situation. And the, the example that he gives is of being at a football match. Um, and, you know, Scottish football is interesting if you like <laughs> watching teams that lose a lot. That right. seems to be my kind of second-hand experience of it. My husband is a Dundee United supporter, so you know he's he's done a lot of that. But right. the he he tells the story of being at a football match where things were not going particularly well for the home side, and a fan behind him shouted, "Fucking boo!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know this needs a swear word somewhere. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to find it. There it is. It's just there. It's just going to go. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. I feel like Kevin Stroud never says think of dead puppies. <laughs> <laughs>